Meatball Talk! I'm Stephanie. And I'm Adam. And welcome to Meeple Talks. So this week we've got Castles of Burgundy, a 2011 game issued by Raves and Burkhart, designed by Stefan Feld. Yes. So in this game, you are a 15th century prince and you have your mm-hmm. own estate and you're trying to create the most influential estate in the mm-hmm. area. Uh, and this is a, you mentioned the Stefan Feld, right? Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this game uh, is like currently ranked number 11 in geek rating on mm-hmm. Board Game Geek. So it has held its own for quite some time. But we're going to let yeah. you know what we think about it. And we, because we decided, you may have seen some of our other videos where we are doing these new to me series, ones that aren't quite newly released, but, uh, you know, we heard some good things about it. So we just mm-hmm. wanted to check it out for ourselves. So now we're going to deliver what we think. Yes. Yeah. We've been thinking Ooh. with our noggin. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look and see how this game is played. Check out the board. So let's take a look at the game components. Uh, let's start with the player board. This is where you have your estate, and you'll see there's different kinds of buildings. There's ships for water, there's mines, there's castles, and all different kinds of areas. So your goal in the game is to place various of these hex tiles onto your estate and score points for them. Um, Now here you'll have, whoops, uh, different actions that you'll receive or be able to do when you place your tiles onto your estate. Uh, Here you have the victory points that you will receive when you finish a little area of one color. Um, You've got some goods here that you can sell. Uh, This is ore here that you can use to um, trade for other hex tiles in the black market on the main board. These are the different uh, actions that you can take during the game. And these two dice are what every player will roll every round in order to find out what numbers they can use for their two actions. Uh, Finally, we have uh, the workers here. These workers tiles can be used to change the die roll plus or minus one. Uh, Now we'll move to the main board and this is the marketplace that all the players will be using to uh, get their tiles that that they will apply to their estate. Um, You'll see all the different kinds of hex tiles along the side. This is the black market in the center. Um, There is a victory point track around the edge. That's for scoring victory points throughout the game. There's also a turn order track which determines who will uh, play first when they roll their dice. Um, This white die, uh, the player who is first will be rolling this white die. Uh, Steph will explain how that works in the game. Um, These various markets place depots are where uh, various market goods will be placed and you'll see they have die numbers as well uh, to determine where they go. Uh, Here we have um, completion bonuses for when you complete an entire color on your board. For example, all of the green spaces. And up here we have uh, an indication of the five different phases in the game. And these are the victory points you'll score for each phase uh, when you complete a small area on your estate. And uh, that's the board. And now uh, let's talk about how to play the game. Sure, so we're just gonna go over a general play through here. So everyone is going to have their individual sets of dice. Uh, Everyone rolls them at the same time. And then the leader, according to the turn order track, is going to do this uh, particular white die. And why that's important is that whatever the value is on that particular die, um, the good is for that particular uh, phase is going to be placed in the corresponding depot of matching that color. So in this case, it's going to go here. Um, Every person is going to decide based on their particular uh, dice uh, values. There are four things you can generally do. One is you can pick up a good or a tile from the general market here and place it into your storage area. You can also, if you have the corresponding die value as well, take a store like a stored good and place it into one of your regions. So let's pretend I'm going to use this three here that allows me to place this particular tile in this spot. The rules for placement is that you've got to have a die value at the same uh, pip value there as the one listed here. Modified to an extent based on the number of uh, workers you have, you can change them up or down uh, one each per per worker. The other rule too is that when you build, it has to sprawl outward, meaning you can only place these tiles adjacent to another tile that's already in position. You can't randomly just go to different spots on the board. It's got to grow out 
from a, a starting point somewhere. So everyone's going to take turns trying to uh, take and place. Also, if you have any goods, this is another action that you can take. So according to the value there, you can sell your goods for the silver links. Uh, also, if you don't really have any actions that you want to take or any goods that you want to take, you can always uh, trade in a die uh, action to just get two workers. So that way it'll help you modify future roles. As a freebie, every two silverling uh, that you have here, you can actually buy from the black market there, uh, one of the goods listed here. Uh, as the turns keep going around, all the different tiles are gonna slowly deplete the availability of what's there available for you. So you wanna be choosy here, and that's why turn order on this uh, turn order track is gonna be very, very important. For the most part, scoring is going to happen throughout the entire game. There are some exceptions though, depending on certain tile bonuses, you may have some end of the game scoring opportunities. And generally, that's the whole game. So, what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> I love these intros, okay. No, but I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting one, and then one of the reasons we wanted to revisit some games sometimes is that... Uh, Games evolve and change and do different things, have different mechanics over time, and people's tastes will go, you know, one way or another. And we just want to see, is this something that has sort of a timeless feel, or is it something that, you know, may have had a dated uh, 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 flow to it and whatnot. Uh, some of the things I, I like about the game, I mean, it's... it's um, Artworks, that's one of the things. Styles and artworks do change over time. And this has a very classic look. So it's got one of those, you know, it, mm -hmm. it looks like it's from, well, maybe 10, 15 years ago or so. It's got that rich kind of uh, coloring. It works with the theme and whatnot. It does have a good feel to it. The board itself, it's not newly stylized, but it works for what it is. One of the things we didn't show you is that we have a... Um, uh, a starter board where everyone has the same kind of layout, but we also have the opposite boards too, where you can actually go with more unique configurations to try to maybe uh, bring you more challenges or, or to just, you know, change the flavor up a little bit uh, with how you want to uh, play the game. So you can choose either side. Um, it is a tile placing game. That's, uh, I mean, it's not too big of a setup. The tiles are small. It's not a complicated or annoying thing to set up as well. And it does have a very pleasurable aspect to it, trying to build in and expand upon your region. Um, the only, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a criticism, but it is something that I noticed in this game is that uh, from time to time we talk about uh, games that are really, really good are ones that have multiple paths to victory. So this is a very good strategy game. It's very, you have to be very selective with what uh, you do. And I really love how you can modify your turns with your, with your people or, or try to, you know, in, improve or enhance upon your, your playability over time, depending on what tiles you're actually selecting. However, the one thing I did notice is that even though it gives the impression of multiple paths to victory, you really can't ignore ships. And I tried to, on a couple different occasions, try really not to expand the ships and try to build other things, maybe capitalizing on, let's say, the early uh, scoring with the uh, uh, early color completions and getting big bonuses at the beginning. But I really found because this turn order has a huge influence on what happens to you, trying to choose first is going to become the most important thing that you will have available to you. Because I try to avoid it. I try not to do it. And again and again and again, no matter how much coin I have or silver wings I have, no matter how many players that I can have to change my pips, mm -hmm. if the item I want just isn't even there, there's no point, right? So you really can't ignore the ship values. And so it kind of narrows your, your strategy a little bit. Uh, it may focus us on doing all the same thing just to kind of ease up on this competitive factor. But uh, other than that, I mean, you may have different opinion about that perhaps, but other than that, it's a really well-designed game. And I think, you know, from Steffenfeld's offerings, we've seen a lot of really good ones. And this is, I can see why this has become a classic. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, this game has a lot of elements of his later game, Oracle of Delphi. I mean, mm -hmm. you're rolling dice, you can modify those dice. So having played this game, I understand how, you know, when this first came out, it was a much more unique mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a very well-balanced game. Um, there are different paths to victory, as Steph mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can try to get single points for single areas, or you can try to get all the colors, or you can try to just be first all the time so that you have the best selection of hex tiles. But none of those choices uh, is better than the other. It really depends strategically on what's available. Um, there's an element of 
what's available now and capitalizing on mm. that. But also there's definitely a, a kind of a long-term strategy in the game, or, or I should say a long game, so to speak, where you forego scoring a lot of the small points during mm. the early phases where they're more valuable. For example, in the first phase, you score 10 points if you complete a little area. Yeah. But at the end, in the fifth <laughs> phase, you only score two. So a mm -hmm. lot of players may initially score a lot of points here, but then they're mm -hmm. spending a lot of time doing that. They're not looking at a longer game where they can get these um, completion bonuses, which are worth a lot, when mm -hmm. you complete all of one color. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to play this. This game is very well balanced. Very similar to um, Puerto Rico is a very old game and a classic oh, game, yeah, yeah. but this reminds me of that game in the sense of it's being very well balanced, and I think that's one of the re reasons why it has a lot of holding power. Um, mm -hmm. It's a game that um, isn't striking in any particular way, but it is um, a game that has a lot of re replayability. Mm -hmm. Like just with the basic uh, set up where everyone's estate is the same, yeah. then there's a similar strategy where if you really want to be the first player, then you're going to need ships. Um, mm -hmm. And your ships are laid out for you. They're center, the center, from the central castle, you can immediately go into ships, or you can immediately go into mines, and mines will get you uh, more of the ore, uh, mm -hmm. which early in the game is really useful, but later in the game isn't really, yeah. because you don't get a lot of ore over five phases. But... Um, but when you flip that over and, and you see something where, you know, the different ships are far away from each other, it, it's a completely different strategy. Mm -hmm. It makes it very interesting to play. So this game has a lot of replayability. It's very well balanced. And, uh, and, I, and I highly recommend the game. If you've never played it before and you're wondering what it's like and you're wondering whether it's worth the money, I think it definitely, definitely is. Yep, and I would have to say I recommend giving it a try too. You can see that even as time goes on, it's still holding its own even as the evolution of games continues mm -hmm. to happen. So As games evolve. As games evolve. <laughs> Some classics are there for a reason. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, but that's pretty much all we have to say for this round. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, come check us out each and every week. We'll have more videos for you. Thank you very much for watching. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.